That's right. Um, so let me share my screen. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Colleen Stovall, and I'm the Director of Programs and Events for AIA Miami and also for MCAD. We're really glad you're here tonight. This is going to be a really great program, and we'll get started in just a moment. Right now, I think I'm going to uh, just flip through a few events that are coming up, and then I'm going to in introduce Craig Akar. The Best of Designs uh, of 2020 is uh, an exhibit at MCAD right now, um, and it'll go through September, and it shows the winners of last year's uh, AIA Miami Design Awards. AECOM is hosting an office crawl for the Young Architects Forum on September 23rd, and um, we hope you guys can join us. Also, another office crawl uh with Gensler on the 26th at 6 p.m and that one will be virtual for MCAD um as a precursor to our film festival coming up in October we're going to have a short film and a panel discussion um on a film a short film called A City of Columns and it's going to talk about uh design in um Osaka Japan and that was on August 18th, coming up at 7 p.m. The WIA and AIA is uh, holding a joint design and practice exchange with AIA New Orleans on Friday, August 27th, and Saturday, August 28th. And it should be very interesting. Uh, the Emerging Professional Awards are coming up on October 1st at 7 p.m. Uh, there will be a book talk on October 21st during our October month, and this will be on Cuban modernism from 1940 through 1970. And um, Victor Dupy and Jean-Francois Lejeune will both be there to talk about the book. And of course, the AIA Miami Design Awards Carnival Celebration is coming up October 29th at Pinecrest Gardens. Um, Tickets are on sale, and I will put the link to buy tickets in the um, chat. And uh, your uploads are due on the 20th. So, uh, and then the last thing I have is um, Give Miami Day is coming up. If you want to help support the mission of Miami Center for Architecture and Design, that's coming up in November, and we will tell you more about that later. So, with that, I would like to stop sharing and introduce should i introduce craig a car there we go right. uh, principal at mc harry and one of our directors of your vice what are you what's your title <laughs> all right so uh, i am first vice president in That's miami okay. which is president elect for 2020 thank you very much colleen sure and uh, we welcome everyone good evening and thank you for joining us this evening let me share my screen all right i hope you guys can see that i'll take that as a yes so again good evening and welcome to part two of AIA Miami's four-part series on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. As Colleen mentioned, my name is Craig Akar, and I'm a member of AIA Miami's EDI committee. I'm also AIA Miami's president-elect, and we'll be very happy to serve uh, you in 2022. 
I'm also the immediate past president of South Florida uh, NOMA and the founder of the Black Architects in the Making program. Uh, we are very excited about this series because it gives us an opportunity to um, uh, share with our members and our allied members more knowledge about the principles of JEDI. You know, organizations throughout the United States and indeed the world are paying closer attention to matters that uh, relate to uh, JEDI. And this is because with better understanding of the issues, it will equip uh, people and companies and firms or profession or community, and especially leadership within these organizations to create the actions necessary to dismantle injustice and inequity. Uh, this is our firm belief that if we allow for more diverse and in, in inclusivity within our profession, that we will create a more compassionate and respectful um, environment where people will not just survive, but where people and firms and organizations will thrive. So to put it simple, it is about removing barriers and creating easier access to the retention of people within companies, profession, and the community. So uh, AIA Miami launched this JEDI series last week. Uh, uh, it, the series will be broadcast virtually weekly for four consecutive weeks. It started last week and it will be aired each Tuesday's evenings at six. The Zoom link that you use to join this particular uh, part two is the same Zoom link that we will use every Tuesday. Last week, Vanessa um, started off the series focusing on justice, which is about dismantling barriers to resources and opportunities in societies so that all individuals and communities can live a full and dignified life. This evening, we'll discuss equity, which is about putting in place resources on, um, on an as needed basis to give access to a more equal outcome. Next week, Tuesday, which is August 24th, Maria Vanderman will discuss diversity, which is recognizing our differences as an advantage. And then the following Tuesday, August 31st, Nadine St. Louis will discuss inclusion, which is how to encourage a sense of belonging. So let's get straight into it. Um, uh, our focus this evening is on equity. Equity is about allocating resources to ensure everyone has access to the same opportunities. The definition uh, to remember about equity is that it provides access uh, to what is needed to afford an individual or a certain group of people the opportunity for equal outcome. The key word there is needed. For generations, advantages and barriers have been um, put in place, whether systemically or otherwise. Uh, uh, and many instances are now a normal part of our society. So much so that uh, many of us sometimes don't even realize uh, that uh, there is an advantages that uh, exist to certain section of our community and not to others. There are so many barriers and it has become so normalized in our society that we don't even realize that it is detrimental and problematic until something uh, catastrophic happens uh, that creates a tipping point causing some type of upheaval uh, that brings it to our attention. An example of this um, has been uh, you know, last year, and this has been happening for a long time, but it has brought to our attention because of the video phone capabilities that we now have that shows the routine execution of Black Americans um, um, in, in this country. And, uh, uh, you know, that has caused action and, you know, as unfortunate as it's been, it has brought about positive action uh, to be knowledgeable about any of these Jedi issues uh, is, is something that we must first recognize. 
that there are advantages and barriers that exist and that we must consciously recognize them when they are placed in our um, uh, stead. And then we take actions to dismantle them. Uh, action is the key word here. And you'll hear this often in this presentation as we must realize that it took deliberate action to put them in place in the first place. And therefore we need serious counter action on our part to remove them. Now, action is a verb. It is a doing word, as I was told when I was younger. This is not something that somebody else must do. This is something that we, you and I, must do something about this. All right, so, um, you, you know, we like to represent our thoughts graphically as people in uh, this kind of profession. We find that illustrating our thoughts is clearer than trying to put it in words. And uh, we have seen where this illustration of people watching a baseball game um, is used regularly and effectively. Uh, in, in an ideal world, uh, there would be no barriers and that everyone, no matter your gender, your age, your size, um, you know, your background, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, you'll be able to um, uh, be afforded the same opportunities and you'll be able to enjoy life. However, the, in the real world, there are barriers causing some uh, uh, to be disadvantaged and making it unnecessarily difficult for everybody to access the necessities to excel um, in life. And not only are there barriers that, um, depending on your age, your gender, your sex, ethnicity, your background, uh, your financial situation, that there are certain advantages afforded to some over uh, others, you know? Um, uh, I, I smile because I see a little note here that says that uh, Jedi principles are not just about Black people um, uh, bitching about being left out of the party. It is more than that because uh, the topic is associated not only with those who shout loudest. Jedi is not only about race. So let us remember that Jedi is about giving um, people access to the resources that they need. So some would suggest that we give everyone equal access to the same resources and that will make everything accessible. Well, um, we'll see how that does not really help uh, in the graphic that is shown right here to the right uh, with that equality written at the bottom of it. Um, we see that the spectators all have the same crate to overcome this barrier, which is represented by the fence shown here, but that does not really result in the same outcome. Um, we'll get a little bit more into the difference between equality and equity further on in the, uh, the broadcast here. But um, the last image that you're seeing here uh, illustrate how the allocation of resources based on need is made to ensure that each person based on their need has access to the same opportunities. This is equity. So the taller person is able to see over the fence, they don't necessarily need any type of resource to um, afford the same opportunity that the others require. You know, some may need some more help than the other because of their particular situation. And that is the difference between um, equality and equity. If we were to leave you guys with one thing um, for this particular series, it is the understanding that, um, uh, uh, that only when we solve the problem of injustice and inequality, we will stand the real chance of achieving sustainable diversity and inclusion. Let me repeat that. Only when we solve the problem of injustice and inequity will we stand a chance to achieve sustainable diversity and inclusion. 
and the level of effort that we put into dismantling injustice and inequity will result in a level of improvement that we will see in our firms, in our profession, in our community, and indeed in the country. Sustainable outcome demands purposeful action. We must do something about what we see around us. So action, action, action. Uh, you know, I'm willing to bet that the people here uh, today, um, all 18 of us, uh, are interested in knowing more about Jedi matters. That's the reason why we're here. I'm also willing to bet that most, if not all of you, already know quite a bit about Jedi, right? Uh, we want to be part of the solution, and so we educate ourselves. In some instances here, um, you know, we're preaching to the choir, so to speak. Um, and this series is not just about talk, by the way. Uh, we're going to be looking at real action, what is going on right now in companies around us who are practicing Jedi principles and the type of results that they're getting uh, uh, um, as a result of that. So uh, what is a recommended steps towards purposeful action? Well, firstly, uh, we need to inform ourselves about issues and uh, identify the problem um, you'd like to tackle. Uh, we need to be very resolute about the solution. We need to keep it simple. We need to keep it accomplishable so we don't frustrate ourselves. Step one, information is key. The second step is, you know, don't be passive. We must get involved. If things don't happen by themselves. We must get involved in our firms, get involved in the profession, get involved in our community, uh, you know, there's a good chance that nothing will happen if we sit back, fold our arms, and wait for somebody else to do it. The third step is to surround yourself with like-minded people and make a plan. You know, uh, uh, you alone, many times, uh, cannot fix the problem. Uh, we need other people to be able to share ideas, to be looking at things from different perspectives so we can attack the problem in a comprehensive way. Pooling our thoughts together and brainstorming the solution is better for us to come up with a more comprehensive solution and it becomes easier and more accomplishable. As we say, you know, uh, more hands make the work lighter. The fourth um, step that we're advocating is to implement the plan after you have um, uh, made it. We must be strategic in how we do this. We may not be able to solve the world's problem, you know, but we can certainly solve, uh, you know, certain problems one, two at a time, and uh, uh, we can certainly influence our immediate circles. Um, around us, whether it is in our firm, whether it is in our local chapter of the AIA or NOMA, whether it is in our whatever organization that we are a part of, we must implement the plan that we have talked about at some stage. Action must happen um, uh, on the ground. And uh, finally, we need to follow up. And uh, uh, that shouldn't be access the plan, it should be assess the plan. <laughs> From time to time, we need to take corrective action as we see necessary. If the plan is going as um, we uh, anticipated, fine. But many times we need to um, look at ways to improve what is happening uh, and uh, uh, take corrective action. So we talk about informing ourselves. And I'm not going to go through each of these graphs. They're available in the resource section um, of this. And uh, Vanessa went through quite a bit of this last week. And I know most of you guys have seen these graphs and you know what they're all about. In short, NCARB and NAAB um, uh, does statistics specifically about um, schools of architecture and emerging professionals, how well they're doing in school, how well they're doing after school in the AXP uh, program, as well as how well they're doing with the, their AREs. The problem is um, that after licensure or 
um, in the actual profession itself, whether it is in architecture, engineering, planning, interior design, it is really hard to get information and statistics about um, you know, demographics and breakdown of people within the profession itself. Yes, the information is out there, but you really have to search hard and uh, long for that information. Why is this necessary? Because we need a control. We need to know where we are. And if we are implementing measures, then how do we measure that so that we know if we're improving and moving in the correct direction? We need to make sure that we uh, um, impress the importance on our local chapters and on AIA National and NOMA National, IID, et cetera, to create the statistics so we can measure our progress and uh, have a better understanding of what is going on. We must inform ourselves about uh, diversity matters, uh, matters of equity, and so forth in our profession. So my own experience, and there are others here in our group this evening, that can tell you that there are lots of students that we have encountered, whether it is in the K through 12 program, and even some people within college themselves who have no idea what the architecture profession is. They have um, lived in a house, they have gone to school, they have gone to church, mosques, they have been to malls, cinemas, etc. But they have never really thought about architecture in a way that suggests somebody actually sat down to design the place around us. And so one of the action that uh, we have taken, um, not only here in Miami, but in Orlando, et cetera, is we have created programs where we're going into communities where children live, learn, and play, and we're telling them about architecture in a very passionate way so that they understand that we love what we do and we think what we do is important, and they too can be a part of that. So educating students about architecture is important for us to improve the demographics that is so woefully lacking in our profession. Uh, we have heard that 2%, uh, you know, uh, less than 2% of the architecture population consists of um, Black professionals. And of that, uh, you know, less than 0.04%, 0.4% consists of black females, right? So, you know, we need to do better about that. And uh, programs like BAM, Black Architects in the Making program in Miami, in Orlando, in um, Gainesville, uh, and soon to be in other places are doing some fantastic job in going into communities to tell students about architecture. Again, action, action is important. You and I can do something about our concerns and uh, uh, that is happening at certain level and we're encouraged by that. Not only is BAM doing that, but there are other programs that are doing similar things. Programs like the ACE program by AIA, Hip Hop Architecture, Project Pipeline by NOMA, et cetera. Um, all of those are great. And if you're a part of that, uh, kudos to you, um, you know, uh, continue and do more. So organizations like AIA and NOMA, IID, et cetera, we also need to, um, uh, help to encourage students who are, um, you know, more likely to fall out of school because of one reason or the other, whether it's through finances, whether it's through lack of encouragement, lack of mentorship, uh, AIA, NOMA, IIDA, Planning Institute, Engineering Institutes need to reach out to these schools and offer mentorship to these students. Also offer scholarships to these students to assist wherever possible. Scholarships are extremely important and should act as incentives to encourage students to perform better and to maintain above grade GPAs and to just do well, to stay in school, uh, uh, to, to finish. You know, the attrition rate is really terrible, especially in minority communities. And then after leaving school, these graduates needs also to be incentivized to sit and pass the ARE and other licensing um, requirements such as the ARE. Uh, incentives like uh, reimbursing uh, students after they have, not students, but emerging professionals after they have passed the exam is something that would encourage students to take the, the exam. Uh, this should be offered at 
you know, in all various levels. The American societies of engineers need to get more involved where that is concerned for their engineers. So too, I've advocated for AIA, NOMA, and IIDA. And then there is this major problem that was identified uh, by the graph that you see on your left here, which is really about entry uh, into the profession. You know, what happens after uh, you have left college and now you're in the working world? You have um, incurred debt that is crippling and attain, uh, attaining a professional degree in architecture and in many other profession um, is really crippling to a significant amount of graduates. Uh, their likelihood after leaving school to own a home as quickly as their parents and grandparents did to own a car, to uh, uh, progress as their parents and grandparents did is uh, way more unlikely today as it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, the student loan debt in the United States has reached a staggering $1.2 trillion. And the average graduate uh, will need to repay more than $35,000. Uh, Vanessa last week mentioned that um, in particular, um, African-American females, black females are um, owing way more money than their counterpart, than anybody else. And there is a reason for that. We need to be able to uh, rescue uh, people who are in that situation. And it is up to you and I. We are the people who make up the system that create this kind of injustice. And it is up to you and I to look at individual needs, which is about equity, and allocate resources to these individuals so that they can have similar outcome to their um, you know, black male counterpart and similar to our white uh, counterpart, similar to our Hispanic Indian and Asian counterpart, okay? Uh, So let's look at some action items here. We can see this graph showing the actual cost of tuition as it relates to the, um, the cost of um, inflation, the rate of inflation over the years. Uh, this is terrible. And uh, uh, there are some action items. I'm not going to you know, go through all of this. The action item that I'm going to suggest here is uh, number one, uh, federal and state government uh, funding has been reduced significantly over the years. And a lot of this is based on political ideology. The two major parties in the United States have very different ideas about student debt, their, the debt reduction and debt forgiveness. The action I'm recommending is pretty simple. Inform yourselves about the representatives that you're voting for and vote on the, uh, on, on the issues that confront you. You know, do not sit idly by and allow others to determine your future. Vote. You know, politics and policies goes hand in hand. And there are politicians that advocate for equity, and then there are politicians who could not care less. Inform yourself about who you're voting for, understand your interest and vote for those who are supporting your interests. And politicians listen to their constituents for the most part, especially when it comes on for time to vote. Make your voices heard. The squeaky wheel is usually the one that gets attended to. Squeak, raise your voices and make sure that you are heard not just as individuals, but as a group. You know, we deserve the leaders that uh, are elected. And if you are not part of the elected uh, process, if you don't vote, then you're going to be given leaders that other people choose for you. Um, another item, 
uh, universities sometimes inflate college um, tuition costs to shape their student bodies, right? Meaning that the actual cost uh, that is uh, the sticker price is not exactly what the cost is for education, but they then offer certain student demographic, maybe certain genders, etc. discounts. We must understand that we must make sure that we align ourselves in a particular position to go after these discounts. Never ever pay sticker price. Uh, and colleges are at that stage now where you can actually, um, you know, uh, negotiate what you pay for tuition. My recommendation is to study hard, uh, to be purposeful about going after and winning scholarships. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say something here. I know I'm going to get flack for this, but do not be too woke to identify a particular ethnic group. You know, I've seen where uh, Black students have disqualified themselves from scholarships because they refuse to identify as Black, even though they are quite capable of qualifying as such. Everybody has the right to identify who they want to identify as, but are you disqualifying yourself uh, by identifying yourself otherwise? And universities also listen to student leadership and many of the ideas that are developed in colleges started off as a result of initiatives made by students. The action plan here is to become involved, advocate for more equitable policies for tuition, you know, there are several colleges, uh, you know, and Ivy Leagues are well known for this, that depending on your household income, right, uh, you can uh, actually get a significant reduction in your tuition. Not all colleges offer this, but I know that Ivy League colleges do from personal experience. And so if your college does not, and you're an alumni of that college, you owe it to the students that are coming after you to go and advocate for that type of policy for your college, for the sake of the, 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 the future students coming out of that college. All right, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with, with, with the preaching right now. Somebody say, amen. We're going to go into examples of workplace equity. We're going to talk from a first-hand experience here. Um, I am the principal of uh, one of the principals of MC Harry and Associates, and I'm also um, privileged to know other firms and what's going on in other local firms. And so I'm going to, to, to discuss uh, this evening some of the equitable practices that are happening within firms such as um, MC Harry and others, and show how an equitable uh, principle is put in practice so that the firm in general uh, benefits. Um, uh, there's a Boston consulting group that conducted a study, and that study showed that a more diverse and inclusive um, uh, firm is likely to bring in almost 20% higher revenues as a result of their EDI practices. Let me repeat that. Firms that practice EDI uh, principles are more likely to be profitable than firms who do not. I can testify that this is true as an owner of a firm that practice EDI principles. Now, I want for us to remember this um, idea, the differences between equality and equity. Remember that equality is not the same as equity and that companies that uh, strive in the workplace um, uh, knows the difference between the two. Remember what we talked about? It is not about providing equal access to everybody, but everyone has their own individual need. Every group has their own individual need. Every person has their own individual need and must be treated accordingly and be 
um, given access to resources according to that particular individual need. Equity is, sorry, let me, let, let, let me repeat that. Equality is about providing the same um, meal uh, full of meat for everybody, knowing fully well that there are some vegans and vegetarians in the group. While equity, on the other hand, attempts to identify the specific needs and requirements of different people with different needs and provide those needs. It's not about race only, it's about ethnicity, nationality, age, gender, sexual orientation. It involves a lot of different um, uh, uh, things. We are people who are made up of different needs and requirements and equity is about providing what is needed for different people. So, Let's talk a little bit about something I'm very familiar with. So uh, the very first um, slide here shows um, some of the members of MC uh, Harry uh, a few years ago. Uh, in about 10 years ago, talking from personal experience, the principals of MC Harry realized that uh, one day they were going to retire from the firm. And so they were reminded by one of their employees who attended an ownership transition seminar that the process of ownership transition um, is relatively simple. And, and this is not strange to the firm ownership because 30 years earlier in the firm's history, its founder, Milton Carlyle Harry, hence the name MC Harry, um, looked within the firm for leadership and found it in Jim Pearsall and Tom Carlson. Um, not to overcomplicate the history here, but pretty much in short, Jim and Tom did the same as Milton um, did and looked within the firm about 10 years ago for leadership. They never really said it aloud, but we believe that one of the key factors in their decision-making to invite Lourdes and myself to ownership is that they believe that cognitive diversity would encourage good decision-making. Cognitive diversity is um, uh, decision-making based on drawing on varying backgrounds to bring different solutions to a problem. Uh, they identified Lourdes because she is a proven leader in the profession for many years at all different type of level. She happens to have a Hispanic background and would bring a certain level of thinking to the firm's leadership. They also soon identified afterwards, and I'm simplifying this, another emerging professional who became licensed relatively recently, uh, but had a zeal to help the community and the profession. Now, Lord has happened to be female, and I happen to be male and unapologetically black, and that is fine. That difference in background and the fact that the uh, Jim and Tom look to not just uh, you know equal uh, this invitation towards ownership, but look to uh, individuals of different background and makeup for future leaders of the firm was about equity. And so they did, so too, Lourdes and I are looking within the firm for similar type of leadership that would be best for the future and the legacy of the firm. Another example of how equity was able to help MC Harry is that recently um, uh, we were able to help a client and uh, the staff of the client and the staff of the firm to have uh, better relations. You know, we had a city job and when it was given to us, the, the staff 
of the city didn't really know the composition of MC Harry per se. But the project was about building a community center in Coconut Grove. And in this area of Coconut Grove, West Coconut Grove, it was predominantly populated by Bahamians. The zoning uh, Miami 21 required that certain type of architectural expression, one that was sensitive to the Bahamian community. And uh, because the firm had a depth and it had the diversity um, of different professionals from different backgrounds from you know, all over the Caribbean, we were able to assign professionals to the design team who interacted with the community. The community was able to see people who look, speak, and relate like them. People who were able to speak the same design language as was required by the program. And as a result, we were able to design a community center that was quickly accepted by the community, by the city, and everybody uh, was pretty happy about the um, solution. Equity enables targeted upskill for a diverse workforce. Now, MC Harris' mission statement is empowering people by design. And this uh, 26 uh, person firm is really a melting pot of emerging professional at various levels of their development. From um, you know, one of our latest employee, um, you know, who is still in school, to one of our other employee at the other spectrum who has over a 40 year experience as being an architect. Uh, they vary in levels of education, in, their, in levels of uh, registration, experience, et cetera. And each individual is treated differently. So uh, Larry, who is our more senior um, staff member, he has a different need from, um, and I'm gonna call names here, you guys probably don't know, but Jalen, who is a, a student of architecture. And so the firm assigned different resources to the two individuals. For Larry, his continuing education is important. His membership in various professional organizations is important. And the firm facilitates uh, Larry in that regard. The same is true for Jalen, who is attending school, needs the security of a job and the, uh, 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 the longevity of a career at a firm. And that is offered to him as a student of architecture. Um, and you know, his, his job is safe uh, um, you know, to, to come back. Also, in terms of tuition and all of that, we're, we're looking into you know, assistance where that is concerned as well. So different individuals, different ways of handling uh, the resources that they need to excel and to continue to be contributors to the firm. Let's look at how equity derives um, and, you know, engagement for specific employees. Recently, one of our employees had the great fortune of having um, a child. Uh, the firm rejoiced with this family. This is great. This is not only great for our employee, it is great for us as a firm, for the continuity of the family relationship that we have had over the many years. Um, uh, we offer our employees, uh, females, uh, mothers, maternity leave, many firms do that. That is part of equity understanding the needs of mothers and allowing mothers to um, spend time with their child and be paid and also offer the opportunity to work from home. Now that remote working is almost a normality. That is extremely important. But not only is that true for the mother, but it is also true for the father um, in this instance, where um, the father was also allowed to stay 
at home, work from home to be productive, and at the same time be an integral part of the formative years of his baby and uh, be able to help with the care of the mom and the child at the same time. Equity is about providing for our staff members depending on their need. Now remember, this is not equality. Everybody did not get that same treatment. The treatment was offered to those who needed it. Um, uh, we talk about this a lot in, in the firm. Uh, we do things together. We have different um, uh, people uh, who have large families, people who have small families, and people who have, have, have you know, it's, it's them alone. You know, uh, we treat each um, employee uh, uh, differently. People uh, with families are offered um, health care with, uh, you know, special considerations to families. People who are single are treated also, uh, you know, with, with a different um, uh, resource uh, for their particular need. We do a lot of things together and we afford all everybody, whether you have a large family or whether you're alone, to come together and to uh, be a part of the family that is MC Harry and Associates. And this is not only true for MC Harry, but we know that there are other local firms that get together and offer families different incentives uh, depending on what is going on in that particular individual life. Let's give another example. Um, there is an employee that is, um, you know, has a health concern. And uh, that person's health concern is of such that their doctors uh, do not suggest the COVID vaccine at this time until it is proven. Uh, that individual is treated with respect and uh, allowed to work remotely and to be productive while staying away from the typical interaction and hustle and bustle of moving around uh, because of that person's health concern. That is equity. That is offering that person what they need to be a productive member of staff. And then here's something else that, um, you know, uh, that's important. Each person has a particular passion. Most people have a passion project that they want to be involved in, whether it is in the community or in the profession. Uh, the firm help with this passion project. Uh, sometimes it, um, you know, allocate resources financially. Sometimes it allocate resources in terms of time, allowing that person the time needed to pursue that particular passion. Uh, the firm oftentimes um, uh, uh, encourage and support community ventures, support professional uh, development. The images that you're seeing here uh, are very few compared to the vast amount of uh, different photographs that we have been involved in profession, in the community, et cetera. The top picture shows some um, community project in, in Liberty City. Bottom picture shows the reestablishment of South Florida Noma right here in the offices of MC Harry. Other pictures shown, um, you know, BAM um, activities going on, whether it's in the firm or outside of the firm in various levels of the community um, as well. And you may ask, so what does that have to do with equity? Again, providing individuals with what they need to do, what they consider to be an essential part of their development. So if there is um, a, a, a passion for helping the profession to develop and, 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 and to become better, that person needs that support. And that person must get that support. And then let's see, what was this picture about? Well, 
to equip uh, the firm to contribute to a shared mission. Um, you know, equity empowers diversity and inclusion to flourish. And each employee who fully understands that MC Harry is about empowering people by design um, will then afford for the firm to be pushing in that one direction. Everybody must know that this is what the firm is about and this is how we're going to achieve and accomplish that. You know, in school, there's 56% of the population in school that is female, yet still only about 18% of the profession consists of registered female architects. For the first time in MC Harris history, more than 50% of the staff is now female um, professionals. And in the firm, there is an equal registration of females and males. That is unusual. The, the, uh, the amount of um, people within the firm is also an indication of the success that we have been having, where we have from about 26 people, we have about, you know, over 25% is uh, Black Americans, over 25% is um, Caucasian, over 40% is Hispanic, and we do have um, a couple of um, Asians in the firm as well. Um, that wasn't set out to fulfill a quota, but we purposefully recruit students, talented students, from local universities as well as from historical colleges and universities. We go up to FAMU to recruit students. We have FAMU graduates on staff and we continue to look for talented people. Uh, let me say this, I've heard um, my counterparts say that they cannot find um, talented and skilled minorities. I call people on that all the time. MC Harry has no problem in finding capable, talented, skilled minorities. Well, as a matter of fact, um, there is a, 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 a whole backlog of people who have applied to the firm um, with that kind of talent, with that kind of background, with you know, different race and ethnicities. So it is out there. We need to find it. We need to be purposeful about doing that. And we have done it. So here are some resources that was used to create this presentation. I should have put there also personal experience as one of the resource here. But with that, I will stop the presentation and we'll open for questions. We have about, uh, I see, about 10 minutes to close. If you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and, or you can unmute yourself and we can talk. No questions? All right. Josiah said, I love your mission statement. How did your firm come up with that? Well, that's interesting. So um, uh, uh, Lourdes and I met for a very long time um, on a Saturday and we followed up and so forth with some ideas, but we also um, asked staff uh, to assist in the formulation of that mission statement. And after we came up with a rough draft, we run it by staff again and fine tune that mission statement, empowering people by design. People meaning we're empowering our clients with good design. We're empowering their users of that facility by um, you know, successfully uh, furnishing the program. We're empowering our staff by encouraging professional development. We are empowering ourselves, um, you know, by, uh, you know, going after what we're passionate about so that we have uh, a, a good and rounded um, a, a life. 
We also empower families to be part of the firm uh, so that they can um, uh, feel a part of our children and really uh, grow up together um, here. Uh, Naomi will tell you that her son uh, grew up um, uh, in MC Harry. Same thing is true for myself, for Lourdes, and for many others within the firm. Uh, Cheryl says, thank you, Craig, for your dedication to improve our community and share your knowledge with our members. Thank you, Cheryl. All right, we have about four minutes left. Any more questions? Let me just say that mentorship is extremely important. And mentorship is a good example of what it's what equity is all about because with mentorship you're um, one on one with an individual uh, it is important to mentor people within your office but it is also important to uh, become a resource for your professional organization where you are also a mentor remember too uh, you might very well uh, be a mentee but you can also be a mentor. I'm a mentor, but I'm being mentored by others as well, okay? And that is about, uh, you know, finding our individual needs. Brianna, hello, Brianna, how are you from Orlando? I genuinely appreciate the dynamic work environment that you offer minorities. Do you have any advice for young designers who work for firms that lack diversity? Um, yes, um, firstly, I would encourage that uh, you do the five, uh, you look at the five action points that were suggested, which is number one, inform yourself about what is going on in the firm. Uh, number two, um, surround yourself with like-minded people within that firm who want to see the same change that you would like to see. Uh, make a plan, and sometimes that plan really need to be um, you know, involved leadership within that firm. Uh, oftentimes, leadership will actually work with staff in order to um, effect the change that staff would like to see, and then implement that plan with leadership. And I'm going to be bold enough to say, if you're within a firm that does not support equity, diversity, and inclusion, leave the firm it's as simple as that i'm going to tell you that right away hey lordas how are you welcome hello can i come work for mc harry <laughs> hey how are you welcome lorda salera is my business partner everybody thank you very much for joining me lordas i actually have a comment for brianna which is kind of in a uh, following up on your statement to talk yes. to your tip gabrielle bullock who is um one of the principals at uh, Perkins and Will, she has become a big advocate and champion of diversity at Perkins and Will. And obviously she's a recipient of the Whitney Young uh, Award of, I believe this year or last year, one of the two. Uh, but she posed the question to Perkins and Will and she said, hey, there is no diversity in my firm. And they're like, okay, well, figure it out. What do we need to do? So that's what, uh, uh, to follow up on Brianna's questions, that's what you need to do. You need to pose the questions. Because sometimes people don't realize that there is uh, that unconscious bias. They don't realize uh, that it doesn't look like it should look because it works to them. So pose the question, and I will second uh, Craig's uh, statement. If they're not receptive to those ideas, then perhaps you should find somewhere else to go where they are receptive to the ideas. But I would argue, I would say probably 90% of the firms are perceptive. They just haven't had somebody ask them the question or tell them, hey, we need to do this. And maybe they just need that person to, to step up to the plate and show leadership. And that's what Gabrielle Perkins said. Well, that's just one particular yeah. type of happens to be very well known, which is why I bring her up as an example. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that kind of thing is really an opportunity for leadership. It's an opportunity for, for you to step up and to lead uh, in that respect. Thank you, Lourdes. Thanks, All right, Colleen, Craig. What I a... think we're at uh, 7 o'clock. <laughs> yes, what a I great... 
a great program. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate it and very inspiring. And um, what's the next program we have coming up next week? Oh, yes. So next week, uh, Maria Vanderman will be presenting uh, diversity. And Maria is part of the AIA Miami EDI committee, has been really very helpful. And, uh, um, you know, her, I'm really looking forward to diversity next week and to see how that principle is practiced within local firms and how that can help us to create a more equitable, uh, a more diverse and inclusive environment, if you will. Yeah. That's great. So we'll see you all next week at seven. Yeah. And thanks for coming. And um, oh, sorry, yes. sorry. Next yeah. week at six. Six. Sorry. At, at six. Same link. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. All right, everybody. Take care. Have a great night. Bye. Good night. Bye. All right, Colleen, I'm going to go get some sleep. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Craig. Thank you. Yeah.